Hi there, I'm Ted Dunning from HPE. I work in the CTO office with all things to do with data fabric. And what I wanna show you today is some of the things that we can do, which you can do in dealing with data so that you can have the storage efficiency of the most efficient encodings and yet the performance of the most performant encodings in the same system. So what we're going to look at today is a fairly typical data ingestion pipeline. And so data comes from here, and that's the raw data that's coming in. It's going to be coming in at a rate of about 100 terabytes per day. Now, the peak would not be distributed evenly, so we can't just divide that by 24 hours and see what we're going to get. We are going to estimate something like 2x that at a peak. And then the analytical data that we're going to retain, we're going to retain it for three months, and it's going to be considerably compressed from the original. And then finally, we're going to keep analytical summaries and aggregates for a long period of time. So let's analyze that, but let's start by talking about how encodings work. Now, in these systems, the way that we store data is not just on one computer a server that has multiple disks. No, we will work with multiple computers working together, a group like this. Now, it's not just four, of course, in practical settings. It could be thousands, depending on how big your data is. But generally, it's at least five, and typically the bottom end is around 10 servers. And we group these together into a single domain of operation that works relatively autonomously to store all of our data, and we call it a cluster. That's no big deal, just what we call it. And they all work together. Now, if we have data that we want to store, like this, what we do is we could write it onto the disk of one of those machines. But that's not quite good enough because disks fail. Disks fails at several percent per year according to some studies about 10 years ago. Uh, it's not clear how big they are, but we have to account for the worst case. So if that disk fails, or worse, if that entire server fails, our data would become inaccessible at best and lost entirely at worst. So what we want to do is not just store the data on one machine. We want to store it on multiple machines. Two, for instance, uh, this one and that one. That seems like it's plenty good because if something fails, we still have a copy. But in fact, it's not quite good enough because if one of those fi fails, then we have one copy left and we can be replicating that again to get back to two copies. But during that time, we could lose another disk. Now, the probabilities of that are much less than uh, losing a particular disk over a period of a year or so, but they're still large enough that we're going to lose some data over a period of 100 years, or put another way, we're going to lose some fraction of a percent over a period of one year. That, again, is a worst-case estimate, but it's a bad enough case that I don't like it. So what's more common in this replicated store, storage style is we would store on three machines. So here are these three machines, each have a copy of our data, so that if we lose one machine or disk, our data is not going to be lost. Now, the problem with this, this is very good. This is a very good solution, but it's, and its performance is excellent, but its space efficiency is not great because we have three times as much disk devoted to storing our data as we would like. We would like to store our data once ideally, or at least store that many bits in some arcane, tricky way. So if we start again with our data, let's look at that, and let's this time split the data into two halves. And we can then compute a result, a combination of those two halves, which is the difference in some sense. Its bits are on wherever the bits are different in the originals. Then we can store these pieces, uh, the TA there, uh, and the DA, and the combination 
into the cluster. Ta-da, as they say. We now have stored three half pieces of our data. So we have a 50% overhead. That's a lot better than we had before with a 200% or 100% overhead when we had two or one extra copy of the data. And if we have a failure like this, 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 this disk has failed right here, what we can do is we can take the data that remains in the cluster, this, this last half and the difference, and we can combine them in such a way that we apply those differences back to the original data and recreate the half that we lost. We can then store that data back in the cluster and we've recovered from the data loss. So we can recover from one loss there. And generally the way we write these things down, the way we describe these encodings is by how many original pieces did we have? How much did we break our original data into pieces? And how many so-called parity blocks or redundancy blocks did we store? If we just store the original data, we have one plus zero. And of course our failure tolerance there is zero. And we can see this here, the one plus zero has 0% zero overhead and zero failure tolerance. That's not as good as we would like, of course. And then one plus one, that's where we have one replica of our data in addition to the original. That has failure tolerance one, but 100% overhead. One plus two, same sort of thing. That's three copies of the data in the cluster. And let, let's focus in on two particular options here. The options one plus two, where we triplicate the data, three copies in the cluster, and four plus two. Four plus two is where we break the original data into four pieces, compute two parity blocks, not just using a symbol difference like we did before, but a more advanced thing. In this sort of encoding with four quarters and two parity blocks, we now have only 50% overhead because the two is only half the size of the four quarters combined. And we can take two failures in the system. So we have the same failure tolerance as triplication, but we've cut the overhead by four. So it takes 1.5 times as much space as the original data. That's good. We could even do better. We could go to six plus two or eight plus two, and we're going to narrow that, that overhead down further and further. Overall, what we do as a rule of thumb is for the triplication case, the one plus two encoding, we just multiply the original data size by four to get the raw disk size. That's the triplication plus some extra space for the file system to operate efficiently. In say the six plus two case, we just multiply the size times two. Again, that's for the 30% overhead or the 25% overhead, depending on what sort of encoding we're using, plus some extra for the file system to work in. Those are a little bit generous, but they're good rules of thumb when sizing the system. So these two encodings then we can use. Now, in a HPE data fabric, the way we do this is we use something called a volume. And a volume, and we're going to draw it as a triangle here. There's no real meaning to that other than it's different from the way we're going to draw a directory. Now, a directory is just what you think of as a directory. But a volume, if you're using the system, if you're not administering it, a volume looks just like a directory. And so we can build a hierarchical system. There's a root volume up at the top, and it contains, as if it were just a directory, directories and volumes, volume mount points as they're called. And then those directories contain directories and files and stuff. And the volumes themselves also contain volumes and directories and stuff. So the volume is essentially a directory with management superpowers. That's in our data fabric implementation. Now, if we look at this, there's a special way we can set up the directory so that we have the directory itself, and that's writing data in a replicated fashion, typically one plus two encoding. But there's a shadow in addition to this volume that upon some activation of a rule or explicit 
forcing. And the rule is typically something like one week after something is created or one day after it's created, then this will happen. What happens is we move the data from the primary replicated version of the volume into the shadow erasure coded version. The effect of this is a shrinking. The read cost is about the same, at least especially if we're saturating the disks in a cluster or part of a cluster. We can get a net aggregate read speed that's about the same. It does cost something to do that, that encoding. We have to read the original and we have to write the parity blocks and we have to compute those parity blocks. And so there's a cost to doing this. But let's look at how it turns out in practice. Let's look at that system again. So we've got the raw data coming in, 100 terabytes per day, but we're only gonna keep one to two hours. So if we assume it's got some sort of peak to valley ratio of like three to one, then that raw data would be about 12 terabytes. We, we wait for an hour, and then we're gonna compress that data over a period of time. And so we're gonna have 12 terabytes that we're going to compress plus some fraction of the 12 from the next hour. Let's call it 20 terabytes. That's for the raw data coming in. And we're gonna store that in a volume that's replicated, one plus two encoding. Now, after that, we compress the data and we can compress this sort of data, this metrical data, because we're doing it an hour at a time by sorting on an ID. And that will cause the compression to be absolutely stellar, typically 50 to one, let's assume 20 to one. So what's gonna happen is the 100 terabytes per day is gonna get compressed down to around five terabytes per day of net new data. And we'll keep that for about three months, call it 100 days. So we're gonna keep about 500 terabytes of data. At the end of those three months, we're gonna munch on that data and just keep some kinds of aggregates that we can use for certain kinds of historical analytics, but we can't use for detailed examination of what's happened. And that long-term archive is gonna be much smaller than the original data. It's gonna be like 1,000th of the original data. So about 50 gigabytes per day, but we're gonna keep it for years. Let's pretend three years is a thousand days. These are round numbers, but that's how we, how we estimate sizes. Now, if we draw a summary here, this table shows how things break down. The raw data, remember it's one hour plus part of the next hour, about 20 terabytes of data as we think about it. We're gonna encode that in one plus two encoding. So we're gonna multiply by four three times plus smush sort of thing. The total there then is about 80 terabytes. The actual analytical data, on the other hand, the data size is about 500 terabytes. We're gonna encode that in four plus two. So let's estimate then a two X expansion. As I mentioned, that's a bit pessimistic, but it's good when sizing. So the size that we're going to get is about one petabyte. Much, much larger than the hot data, the raw data coming in. That's because even though it's compressed a lot, we're keeping it a long, long time relative to the one to two hours. And then finally, the archive, we're going to also encode in four plus two. It's gonna be kept for a very long time, but it's very, very small relative to the original data. So it'll be about 100 terabytes. Now, if you look at this, our size here is completely dominated by the analytical data, which is about a petabyte. On the other hand, the data write volume is very, very heavily dominated by the raw data. If we write out this sort of summary, we see that the space overhead the total space required to store all of the data relative to uh, the four plus two encoding that we could do is about 4%. The cost of keeping the raw data in an inefficient encoding for performance reasons is only about 4%. On the other hand, the performance penalty of doing the erasure coding, because we only do the erasure coding on the compressed data 
is also right around 5%. So we're getting the best of both. We're getting the performance of the 1 plus 2 encoding, and we're getting the space of the 4 plus 2 encoding. This is a very odd situation in computing where usually things go against us both ways. Here it's going for us in both ways. And the read speed overhead of reading the analytical data, this stuff, or the archive data is near zero. And that's because the original data is still there. There's a single copy of it, plus parity blocks, but we just read the originals. We ignore the parity blocks, except when some sort of hardware fails, or we add disks, or we remove them, or we change the encoding. So in summary, we can have our cake and eat it too in an encoding sense. We can have the performance of triplication in a write sense and in a read sense, and we can have the space efficiency of erasure coding in the same system on the same data ingestion pipeline. This is really cool. And it's all about the lazy write technique that we use on volumes and the fact that you can designate how volumes should be treated. The fact that they can use the file-oriented age, creation time, and other parameters in order to determine when to erase your code data. That's an option that's not available at low-level storage devices, and so it would be much harder to do. It is available as a hint in an advanced distributed storage system, file system, data system, like the HPE Data Fabric. I'm Ted Dunning. I work in the CTO office, and this has been fun. Let's do a lot more of this. Thank you very much.